Universal Magnetic Parallels. In this video, I'm going to explain what they are, I'm going to show you how they're used, and I'm also going to show you how I made a set. Because this video is quite long, I added a time index so you can zoom to your favorite part. Standard boilerplate disclaimer. What is a Universal Magnetic Parallel? Okay. So let's compare the two. This is a standard magnetic parallel, and this is a universal magnetic parallel. When you set this on the, on the magnetic table on the grinder, these lines have to be in line with the lines on the table. This unit here can be placed this way, this way, this way, this way. Any way you want, this guy can be placed down. So you do lose some magnetivity going from this style to this style. But this is universal. I can turn and rotate this any way I want. But this guy here, as soon as I break it a small amount, the magnetic flux cancels each other out, and this is extremely weak. So we don't want to do that. You absolutely can't have it facing this way. And I'll demonstrate that on the magnet in a moment. Okay, now let's test the magnetic strength. So we have our setup here. We have our standard magnetic parallels. We have... This is the proper way of setting up so that the lines are in line with the lines of the magnet. Then this guy here is completely opposite. So this guy here should get theoretically around 50% of the magnetivity from here to here. This guy here can be set up at, at a skewed at any angle and it probably gets about 30% of the magnet. So let's put that to the test. So right now I have the magnet on, but I'm only at about five or 10% of what the actual magnet strength is. So let's do a test here. So how I'm testing this, I don't have a Gauss meter, so I can't really test it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see at what point does this stick? So if I put this onto the magnet and put it on all the way, it is sticking when I put it across multiple poles. Okay, and it's barely sticking, I mean barely sticking. I put it onto here and it's sticking as well. So a lot of magnetivity is going through here, here, absolutely nothing, here, nothing, here, nothing. Okay, so let's turn the magnet up a little bit more. Let's turn it up to around, let's say that's 25%. Put it on there. Obviously, that's going to stick well. Well, pretty well. Put this guy on here, and it sticks just as well. I'm surprised these, or this magnet is really good quality. This guy here, and it sticks as well. So, what I'm seeing now is that you're probably getting about 80% magnetivity running through here and maybe about 70% magnetivity running through here and zero. And this guy here is the exact same, no matter what angle you put this on. So the more we go, the more it's going to go through. But I'm saying 80%, 70%, 100% around average. Now, why do we need this? Like... Can't we always just have them facing this way? Well, let's take the magnet off here for a second so I can readjust these guys. These guys facing this way, I can only put them facing here so I could put a part here to here. I can't turn around and go this way. So if I have a larger piece, I'd have to get larger magnetic parallels. With these guys, I could put them anyway. So imagine you have a large plate with a cavity sticking down. That's where these guys come into play and work really well. On the smaller stuff, you can put it in a vise, and these guys really are not all that useful. But on larger flat plates that you want to grind or have cavities coming down, another drawback of these, there's always positives and negatives. These guys here can go this way. This one obviously cannot go that way. It can only go this way. And you will lose... The higher you get on these magnets, you will lose a little bit more of magnetivity, but that's just to be expected. If you know that that's gonna happen, you can expect that outcome and you won't have any problems. So what I also recommend is when you're using these to block them up with a solid plate on the end when you put your workpiece down so that it can't shoot off the end because these are a little bit weaker than the actual table magnet. My attempt to explain how a magnetic field works so today, I want to demonstrate what it looks like to see a magnetic field or a magnetic flux between two magnetic poles. So what we have here is we have two magnets that are very powerful, and we have iron powder, and the 
iron's attracted to the magnet. So what we want to see is the magnetic field that goes between one, a north pole and a south pole between these two magnets. Now imagine you had a bunch of these magnets in a row, and that is how our magnetic table works. So I'm going to put this over top of here, this in, and I'm going to sprinkle powder all around. Now eventually what will happen is a bridge will form between the two magnets. And even if you try brushing it away with your fingers, it still attracts until the two magnets come together, closing that loop. And if you take a look around the outside here, where the magnets are not as strong, that's the field trying to pull it in. So you see the dark, and if I tap it, how it attracts to it. And now how to make a set of universal magnetic parallels. I started off with two pieces of one by two by five brass. Made my whole pattern in Mastercam. It is best to spot face and drill this on a CNC machine. There's 218 holes, and that's a lot of holes to drill. Now we need to make the pins to go into the holes. Okay, so what we have here is we have our work piece here. Put this guy in, and then we pull this guy down on here, and it's gonna cut them off to 1.1 inches. Uh, pretty basic. This guy's like 50 some years old, it's an antique, and it works great. I refurbished this grinder about four years ago, and it's worked awesome ever since. I ended up using seven four-foot lengths of drill rod to make the pins. A special shout out to Richard Dirks for helping me with this animation. Looks kind of cool, doesn't it? Okay, this looks like a bit of a hodgepodge of stuff. Uh, we do need the Loctite. We have a little container for the Loctite. We have our work pieces. We have our bag of extra inserts. Uh, we have a wood piece to hammer it on. We have earplugs, we have gloves, needle nose pliers to hold the parts, and a hammer. So we put a little bit of red on here. Slide that down. Into the hole she goes. And we hammer it in place. This took forever to put these guys in and to grind them. Uh, I'm surprised how long it took. Rough machining. This was probably the most difficult part because there's not a lot of room to hold on to this from underneath to set the parallels down to machine this parallel. Uh, the added bonus is that the Loctite when you're machining it actually smells pretty good. Grinding the parallel surfaces. In today's grinding quick tip is using a Sharpie or a magic marker. Circle around your workpiece. No, that doesn't wear off any spirits or anything else or give you good luck. What it does is if you have to remove this piece on and off, what you can do then is put it back in the same spot without having to reset any of your stops on the machines. So quick in and out and we're good to go. Our third quick tip is if you have an uneven surface and you're not sure, measure them, put the largest surface at the back like we do in all of our other previous videos. But what you can also do to see what's being cleaned up and what's not being cleaned up, you can take a magic marker and, well, one that works better, and write on your workpiece, and then you'll see what's been ground off and what hasn't been. the ground. I'm still on roughing. I just finished this one side and I want to show you the difference between doing a spark out pass and not doing a spark out pass. Okay so this one here was done with just regular roughing. This one's done same roughing setting but done with five spark out passes. It's difficult to see in the video but it's really easy to see when you're looking at it in person. I'm going to try and zoom in the white spots are more prevalent on here than they are on here. 
adding the chamfers. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna face off the outer edges, remove there's a couple slight imperfections in here, and then we're gonna stand up and square them. I'm putting my workpiece in and I'm putting it in on a skewed angle. So if you can see, I'm far off of where I wanna be. I just nip the vise up so I can actually move this without damaging the workpiece at all. So I put this inside of here, push it up against, and now I'm gonna tap my hammer up against here until I see no light. Just keep tapping gently. Now I did use an exaggerated amount. Gentle taps when you get closer, see how there's almost no light, almost no light, no light. Okay, so now I know that this is square. I'm going to tighten the vise down to my final tightness, I guess we could say. Then I'm going to double check again to make sure that I have no light coming through, okay? Moving the workpiece in while I'm rotating the cutter backwards. So I want to get a friction feel. See how I'm hitting? Now I'm hitting, I can't physically turn the cutter. Now I'm moving away and I'm clear. So now I'm zero. So I can zero my, my readout here and I can move in. I'm going to probably do about 65 thou and see what it looks like because I don't have any real dimensions on this here piece. that perfect now we just flip the block over do the same thing on the other side And rinse and repeat. Okay, now to do this one, <clears throat> I don't need to change any of the settings. It's the exact same setting because we're coming off using this as the stop and machining along this edge. Okay, somebody might be asking, Ray, why are you not doing both of these at the same time? These are not ground, they're only machined, and they are the same size because I machined them to the same size. But I'm not in a hurry. If I was going to do that, I wouldn't put them close together like this. What I'd do is have them spread apart. So one would be on one side of the jaw and the other one would be on the other side of the jaw. Okay, all what's left now, let's zoom in. All that's left is to put the little flats with a file on the corner. See how this one has a sharp? That guy there is a flat. And that guy there has a flat on it as well. So it looks like a little diamond. So before and after. Engraving shop and math. I'd like to hear your guys' opinion on this. Is it a silly thing to engrave your tools?
making the box. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take all of this stuff out, cut these ribs out, remove the side pieces, and pull everything out of the inside here, and then 3D print a new piece to go on the inside. This was surprisingly easy to remove. It's a soft wood, and uh, I love the way that this box turned out. Okie dokie. So now that we have the guts removed here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print 3D print something so I can set the blocks inside. This is my fancy numbers here. And it's going to have a some kind of container to put something else in. So I don't want to waste the space. I'm not sure what to put in there. So if you have any suggestions, let me know. I'm going to take the heat gun because you try and peel these off and they half stick. Then I'm going to take a light, I'm going to take all the hardware off. Take a light sanding and sand the outside of the box down. Okay, so I removed the stickers and the hardware. Vacuum sealed them into a bag so I won't lose any of them. And now it's time to do a light sanding. Okay, so I did two sandings on this guy. <clears throat> Clean up the outside nicely. Here's the top, no more stickers. Maple finish. Ah, it's not turning out bad at all. Looks pretty nice. We're going to use this piece here, we're going to 3D print it, and we're going to put this inside of the box, and it'll hold the parallels and keep them in good shape. So this is what it looks like in the 3D printing slice software. This is what it looks like when it's actually printing. This camera is the AI camera from the 3D printer. The printing turned out nice. And the staining of the box turned out nice. I have to laser the lid and probably the front. This is the software that I use for the laser machine. It's called Lightburn. It's very easy to use. Um, see here we'll select everything and this is what it'll look like when we burn all of the red are traverse lines where the machine rapids back and forth and the white is what's actually going to be engraved told you this was going to be a long video Believe it or not, this project took me over two years to create. There was all sorts of stalls and stops waiting on material and then other things had come up. But I'm glad that I got it done and the whole package turned out great. A lot of people don't realize the amount of things that go into making these videos into making the parts. Just the software alone, I use SolidWorks, Mastercam, Canva, Adobe, uh, Microsoft Movie Maker, and Lightburn just to mention a couple of the software used. I also have to give a shout out to people who helped me with this video. Aiden, Richard Dirks, and Andrew Spencer. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, it's free, and it'll help me out. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section. If you have ideas for new tools, or something else that I haven't thought about, please let me know. Have a good night, and thank you for watching.